I, I'm quite honored actually to uh, host for the very first time Kelly with us. Um, I would like to again restart my uh, introduction <laughs> to her with her bio, impressive bio. As I mentioned, Kelly has been a, a great mentor, colleague, and a role model for me for the last four years. I learned a lot with her. We have quite a kind of similar uh, career background uh, to start with, at least. Um, so Kelly is the director of technical strategy at the University of Nottingham, where she began her career career as a junior medical technician in 1999. She now leads an award-winning program to enable the strategic and professional development of the university's 700 plus technical staff across the UK and Asia. So it's very similar to actually our numbers at Sanger. She's passionate uh, advocate for technical skills, roles and careers in higher education and research and has written for the Guardian Times uh, Higher Education and Nature. So if you're interested, I'm sure you will be able to find those articles. Kelly founded and leads the Technician Commitment, a sector-wide initiative to ensure visibility, recognition, career development, and sustainability for technical skills um, across uh, technical community in higher education and research institute, which uh, currently stands at uh, over 115 in institutional signatories and uh, sector su supporters. I think when I started, that number was around 50, so a huge, huge increase in the last four years. She leads 5 million Research England funded program called Talent, uh, awarded to the Midlands Innovation University to advance status and opportunity for the technical community. Throughout her career, Kelly has created, facilitated, and led a number of opportunities for the technical community. These include the UK Higher Education Technician Summit and Poppin Prizes. We had in the, uh, this year six nominations from Sanger and two uh, shortlistings there. And we had in the past actually an award for our sequence operations team. The Herschel Program for Women in Technical Leadership, and we are a big supporter of that at Sanger as well. Uh, the UK Technology Specialist Network, TSN, and TechSpest. In 2023, it was announced that she will lead the new 5.5 million UK Institute for Technical Skills and Strategy uh, Institute. So um, I'm super excited to hear her talk. And uh, I know we will see amazing things in the coming period. So I'm, I think we are all impressed with the work actually Kelly is reading at, uh, leading at Technician Commitment, um, which I was very lucky to see witness actually the progress of it over these four years. And I can't think what will happen in the coming four years. So I think great days are waiting for us. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That was a really generous Thank you. And hello, everyone online. The camera is very close. So <laughs> I feel like I need to stand back a little bit. Uh, we've had some technical issues. I'm really sorry, but I'm hoping these slides will move on. That's it. So fingers crossed. Um, so as Bertrand said, my name is Kelly Beer. Um, I am a technician by background. Um, I've been a technician since 1999, so 24 years now. Um, I have worked in areas such as immunology, imaging, biophysics, optical engineering, and had a wonderful varied career as a technical. Um, member of staff at the University of Nottingham, um, where I now lead um, a team of wonderful sort of 700 plus technical you know, professionals across our institution. Um, I've been really fortunate that over the last decade, I've had a part-time secondment with an organisation called the Science Council, who many of you might be familiar with. And what that gave me, I guess, is a platform to try and affect some change nationally for the technical community. And I'll say a little bit more about that in a moment. Um, I thought I'd just prove to you that I'm a technician just since <laughs> my first day at work. Um, that's me in the middle, as you can see, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to say that just to see if anyone's really interested. <laughs> uh, that's me as a fresh-faced 18-year-old on the right at the screen there, um, on my first day as a junior medical technician at the University of Nottingham. Um, I'm going to be honest, I didn't know that these jobs existed. I didn't know you could have a wonderful career as a technical professional in a higher educational research institution. As an IAB 18 year old, I thought universities were full of professors and students. I didn't know there was a whole, you know, amazing workforce that actually makes research and education and innovation happen. Um, I was unable to access the university in the traditional sense. Um, quite simply, my family and I, we couldn't afford it. Um, the fees have come in, into play then. Um, so I just looked for any job that would pay for me to do a degree part time. And that's how I accidentally became a technician. 
to this day, I don't know how I got this job because um, my A levels weren't in science, so I'm not quite sure how I managed how I managed it. Um, but yeah, in November 1999, I became the newest technician in the division of immunology. Um, I loved it. I very quickly came to realise how essential we were as technical staff to, you know, enabling research to, to the student experience. We were hugely impactful, you know, on the students' experience through that institution, the knowledge exchange, and you know, to the university culture in general. But I quickly came to realise that the culture for the technical profession, not just at Nottingham, you know, further afield too, wasn't always that positive. Um, hopefully you can read that. Um, <laughs> often as technicians, the word technician conjures up a number of negative stereotypes. When I talk about technicians, I mean technicians at every level of the system, you know, who are all absolutely essential. So technical professionals who do wash glassware, but there's many different ways to wash glassware and that's absolutely essential for our experiments. Also technicians, you know, who are world leading, you know, technology for experts, methodologists and, and so forth, you know, the whole sort of system of technical expertise we have in the university we refer to as students. To be honest, I think this is still what my parents think I do. They think I have a trolley <laughs> and a white coat and uh, I wash some bottles, but you, you know what I mean. Um, I've worked hard over the last few years to try and really change a cult change the culture for you know our profession. And that's because those negative connotations that can come with the word technician lead to this. I've heard so many colleagues say this, I'm just a technician. Don't ask me, I'm just a technician. And actually, when I first entered higher education in the late 90s, I felt very down to nabby. That makes sense. You know, upstairs, downstairs, you know, the technicians were below stairs staff who were doing stuff that were not to be seen, if that makes sense. And our academic colleagues were the ones who were meant to be seen. The culture really wasn't going to Um, I must say, I must caveat, caveat that with, you know, I've had some fantastic support, you know, from Nottingham and, and across the sector, you know, and from immediate research groups and so forth. You know, as a technician, I'm not saying it's all doom and gloom. It certainly wasn't. But I think it's really important to reflect on what the culture was like in the late 90s and preceding years for the community. <laughs> And so, as I mentioned, I've worked quite hard with a number of, of number of colleagues to try and really, I guess, change the culture for the technical community in higher education and research. Um, I'm here today to talk to you about a new institute, which, as you mentioned, but I think it's really important that I explain how that institute came into being. So I just wanted to sort of give you a whistle top dot tour, if that makes sense, of what's happened over the last six years or so. So in 2017, I founded an initiative called the Technician Commitment. Um, the Technician Commitment is funded by the Gatsby Foundation, and it was hosted by the Science Council, and I did that in my part-time second role that I mentioned. The Technician Commitment is a really simple concept. In essence, it's a pledge that we ask employers of technicians to make at universities or research institutes. And we ask them to sign a one-page form, and by signing the Technician Commitment, they're committing to advance against some key challenges that have impacted the technical community over the years. And they are visibility, recognition, career development and sustainability. When I first launched the Technician Commitment, I would have been like amazed if I could have got five organisations to sign it. But in May 2017, we actually launched with 36 founders signatories. And as, as you mentioned, you know, that number has grown hugely to over 115 signatory organisations to the Technician Commitment. We also have a number of supporter organisations. So in parts we have universities and research institutes who sign the commitment. We also have organisations like learner societies, professional bodies and funders who supported the commitment and really, you know, increased their engagement and support from the technical community, which has been wonderful to see. The technician commitment has also led a lot of research into our profession. And um, that was something that I felt was incredibly important because as a sector, we do have a lack of strategic insight into the technical workforce. Um, so there's an important gap to fill. So it's been wonderful that we've been able to sort of push some research in that space. Um, and we've also been able to influence policy at a government level too, actually, you know, to think about when we're talking about research and development in this country, we can't just be talking about our academic professorial colleagues. We've got to be thinking about the whole system and obviously technical staff are absolutely integral to that. Um, we've got a short film, which is just going to summarise some of the progress and impact of the technical equipment over the last six years. But ironically, we've hit some technical difficulties. <laughs> so I'm going to try and play it. Um, apologies to colleagues on the call. You might not get any sound, but the words do come up. So hopefully you'll get the idea and we can send you um, a short link to the film afterward. It's only a very, very short one. I think it's sort of 90 seconds, two minutes. So let's just see if it works, if that's mm -hmm. okay. Oh. Can you check? 
is very dramatic. <laughs> um, I'd, have, I'd have the company who made this make it look like a film trailer. I think they're so cool. Um, so we'll send a link around afterwards for sure. Um, so there's a lot more I could say about the technician commitment, but hopefully that film gave you a bit of an idea as to some of the progress and impact we've driven over the last six years. And I guess what the technician commitment has done is create an environment and I guess and a bit of a culture change where you know the challenges that are impacting the technical profession are, are being discussed, they've come to the fore. Um, and in 2020, it allowed us to apply for some further funding, actually, from Research England. And in 2020, we were awarded just under £5 million from Research England for a project called Talent. So Talent was awarded to the Midlands Innovation Universities, but some of its work had national reach, and I'll say a little bit more about that. And I think it's just important that I explain to you, you know, the timeline so you can understand where the institute came from. Um, so as I mentioned, Talent was a just under £5 million award from Research England. Um, it had three key work streams, um, a national policy commission to try and address that lack of strategic insight that we have about the technical community in this country in higher education and the research space, um, some culture change projects where we piloted activity in the Midlands Innovation Universities before being able to roll them out nationally, and a third work stream about bespoke training and development opportunities for technical staff. Traditionally, as a technician, when you went to access training, and particularly in a university setting, um, a lot of it was geared up for administrative staff or academic staff and you know often as technicians we needed something a little bit different so through talent we've created bespoke technical training in a number of areas. I just want to talk to you today about the policy commission. Um, this was a really large piece of work. As I mentioned as a se sector we have a lack of knowledge and understanding about the technical community, the skills, the workforce and so forth and we brought together a commission through talent to really try and address this. So you'll probably recognise some of those faces there, but we called together a board of commissioners. So on there we have vice chancellors, we have representatives from funders, we have technicians themselves, representatives from professional bodies and learned societies and industry. We brought all these colleagues together. They worked together for around two years actually to really address the fundamental questions impacting the technical community. I won't read all of these out, but the commission looked at a number of key themes. We looked at you know, who technicians are, what we do, what the workforce characteristics are, how we're funded and resourced, what our career pathways are, how we're developed, how we're perceived, recognised, represented on decision-making committees and so forth, how we're represented in policy at an institutional but also sector and government level, and how we can work in partnership actually to really you know, improve um, and, and provide more opportunities for the technical community. The result was this landmark policy report, um, which had 16 overarching recommendations to the sector and um, to a range of stakeholders. So we had recommendations for funders, recommendations for technicians themselves, recommendations for employers, for government policy makers, and so forth. We launched this virtually in February 2020 because of the pandemic. We were in another sort of semi-lockdown then, but we actually had a formal reception at the House of Lords in May 2022. And it was really important to me that we did take this to Westminster, you know, and we gave it the, you know, 
and the importance of prestige and stature, if you like, because it's really, really, you know, fundamental work that we need if we're thinking about research and innovation in this country. The reception was really wonderful, actually. I was really worried because the worst thing that could have happened for me was that this report, which is pretty much like a PhD thesis, to be honest, would sit on a shelf and become a dusty another report on a shelf. And that's not what the Commission report was for. The Commission report was absolutely to affect change in organisations. And we really wanted to ensure that those recommendations could be enacted. Um, you can see some of the media um, that surrounded the launch of that. And it's been really, really encouraging to see a number of technician commitment signatories and supporters really take those recommendations and enact them. I'm not going to talk you through all 16 recommendations, but to give you an idea, there are things around, you know, career pathways, you know, bespoke training, strategic insight, and so forth. Um, and you can access the commission online. But recommendation 16, the last recommendation, advised that there should be the creation of a new sort of collaborative entity or organization, provisionally to be called the UK Institute for Technical Skills and Strategy. Um, as you can imagine, I kind of thought, oh, how on earth is, how am I going to make this happen? You know, who makes, whose responsibility is this? Um, but over the course of the next year, um, I worked with Research England and we worked up a new proposal um, for some funding to establish this new institute, which would absolutely be a conduit between the technical community, professional bodies, learning societies, government, funders, universities. And so in 2023, really delighted that we were awarded five and a half million pounds from Research England to establish the new UK Institute for Technical Skills and Strategy. And, and here's a couple of um, the tweets and quotes that came out from UK UKRI. Um, and again, some of the press, and there's one that really does make me smile. Um, you see here, our Prime Minister looks very excited. <laughs> <laughs> National Institute for Skills and Strategy. Um, so I wanted to spend the rest of the talk talking to you about what the Institute is and what it's going to do. Um, this is the new branding, which we've just launched, so you're you know, getting a sneaky peek at this. Um, you can probably see that we've taken the colours of the Technician Commitment logo and the talent, you know, to show the sort of um, origins of this Institute. Um, but our vision, really, as, as ITSF, is that the UK is a global leader in science, in engineering, in the creative industries too. But that global leadership is enabled by technical capability and capacity across HE, across research and innovation. Um, but crucially, that technical skills, roles and careers are recognised, they're developed, they're respected and they're aspired to. Um, and our mission as an institute is to accelerate and fulfil the potential of UK technical skills um, across um, HE, research and innovation. Um, I'm going to talk to you about some of the sort of strategic objectives of the institute, but I think really What's important to me is some of the practical things that the Institute's going to do to benefit the technical community. Um, I should tell you as well that we're really lucky we have a hugely multidisciplinary team working in this Institute. I'm very, very excited to have, you know, academic expertise um, in vocational technical education. We have policy expertise, which is amazing because I've been fumbling my way through trying to influence government policy over the last few years. We've also got, you know, really experienced technical practitioners who are bringing their experience and skills to the table um, and learning and development expertise too. So it's really, really exciting to be working with such colleagues. Um, we have a technical council, so a little bit more about that later, um, which is providing a, a technical voice to the work of the Institute. And we also have a pretty senior high level um, advisory board comprised of many sector stakeholders. I think what's really important and to convey is that this institute is a really collaborative endeavour. So you'll recognise a number of the logos, I'd imagine, at the bottom of that slide there. These are all organisations who partner with us on the bid, so letters of support and so forth. And I think what's really important to note is that these weren't generic letters of support. You know, these people have really got skin in the game. They're really committed to helping us drive the agenda forward for the technical profession. And that's been wonderful, really, really positive. So the Institute is going to have four hubs and helpfully they all begin with I, so I can try and remember them. <laughs> um, the first one is Insight, and this is our sort of Insight hub where we're going to be generating new research, knowledge and understanding of technical skills and workforce in this country, building on that foundational work of the current commission report. The second I is Influence. This is our policy area, our policy and advocacy. So we want to be informing interpreting and you know influencing policy pertaining to technical skills, roles and careers. The third hub is innovation. And this is where we're going to be introducing innovative practice 
and thinking differently about how we can work to support technical skills and careers in R&D and education. And the fourth is integration. And this is where, you know, we can work together to embed that good practice that we find through our research, through our policy and through our innovation. Um, we've actually added three more eyes recently. We seem to have a theme going on. <laughs> um, one of them is about how we want to engage with private business and industry in this space, where we can acknowledge its huge and so forth. The um, fifth one is international. That's because there's a lot of interest internationally in the work of the Technician Commitment and this new institute. There's nothing like this globally in any country that we can find. Um, so we're really keen to ensure the UK you know, leads the way in this regard and that we can support international colleagues to help build something in their own countries as well. And then the last one is around institute sustainability. It was sustainability, but it did begin with ours, so we've got institute for a bit. <laughs> but this is about, whilst we've got that three years of funding to really get this thing established, we've got to ensure it's sustainable long-term so we can continue to support technical colleagues across the country. Um, so a little bit about each of those, I'll be brief. Um, so in Insight, um, as I mentioned, this is about how we can conduct new research, um, both grey literature and academic papers about you know, the roles of technical staff in the higher education and research and innovation system. We've pulled together a very small group of people. This is every academic colleague who has ever written anything about technicians. So as you can see, it's a very small field, <laughs> um, but they're all working with us. Um, it's on this agenda. It's going to be headed up by Professor Andy Moyes, who's top left there, um, who's a very esteemed um, professor and academic in this space. We're really excited to be working with him. In terms of influence, um, there's a number of different practical ways we're going to be working in the policy arena. One example is some work on T levels. So many of you may be familiar with T levels, the technical alternative to A levels, for example. You may be aware that if you're um, a 16 year old who embarks on a T level in science, you're expected to do a 45 day work placement. The Department for Education are a little bit worried because we haven't got enough employers offering those 45 day work placements. Couple that with universities and research institutes, you have an aging population of technical staff. And actually, well, shouldn't we be hosting those work placements and developing a new pipeline of technical talent? Um, so we're employing a dedicated UK wide T level coordinator who's going to be working with universities and research institutes to support them in hosting T-level placements, those 45 days. Really excited about that. We're also going to be piloting a new way to encourage organisations to invest, again, in a new pipeline of technical talent. So particularly in universities, we have a challenge where whilst the technical population is aging, as universities, we're not doing enough to invest in sort of junior roles and so forth, like apprenticeships and so forth. There's a bit of activity going on, and we've definitely seen an increase in activity since the advent of the technician commitment. There's still quite not enough going on. And our problem is, whilst our university executive boards get behind the technician commitment and technical staff and technical managers are behind the technician commitment, the people who hold the purse strings tend to be our heads of departments, sort of um, heads of schools and so forth. And when they're given a proposal whether to employ a new professor who potentially can impact their rep rating or two new apprentices, they tend to go with the professor. So we've got to try and influence them to think a little bit differently. So we're going to be offering match salary funding for new apprentices um, to try and encourage and incentivize these universities to invest in this space. And we're starting in physics because physicists are our oldest group of technicians, actually, nationally. So we're going to pilot an activity in collaboration with EPSRC and the Institute of Physics to see if we can just trial, you know, a change in thinking and influence in that space. And if successful, we'll be rolling this out into the biology spaces and chemistry spaces. We're continuing a very close collaboration with UKRI. This is their paper in the Teams plan, which was published in March earlier this year. And you can see written in that they're going to be working with us very closely to ensure that we can absolutely support the technical community and technical skills rules and careers across. Our third theme is innovation, and this is probably the one I get most excited about because this is where we can do things a little bit differently. Um, building on some work that we trialled in the talent programme, we're going to be launching a new national technology and technical expertise showcase. So at the minute, when our universities and research institutes think about technology, I don't want to make, I don't want to be too generalistic here, but I have a lot, I hear a lot of people getting very excited about Shiny Kit. They don't always think about the technical expertise you need for that shiny kit, if that makes sense, like to drive it to its limits, to push it beyond its boundaries, to maintain it, to run it, and so forth. 
And we often have in this country, like we've got some databases now, which you might be familiar with, where it's databases of kit and facilities across the country. But we, we list the kit, but we don't talk about, you know, the techniques because you need to go with that. So we're going to be bringing those two things together in a new showcase. Okay. We've also launched a new UK technology specialist network. So this is a new national network of technical specialists. So traditionally, to have a career as a technician, you had to drop your specialism and become a manager. Um, more recently, because of the technical commitment, we've seen a lot of focus on that specialist pathway now, which is emerging in a number of organisations. We have a network, a very um, well-established network of technical managers. We wanted to create one for technology specialists. Um, we actually have a little steering group here. You might know some of these colleagues from um, some of the different organisations across the UK. Um, we held a first conference for the UK Technology Specialist Network in Edinburgh in April, where we welcomed over 160 colleagues. And we're hosting our next one in, um, I think it's in April, yeah, in um, Bath. Um, I was going to get you to guess then, but it's pretty obvious. <laughs> Um, in Bath. Um, this is all fully funded, so we make it free to attend, and it's wonderful that we can bring like hundreds of people together to discuss in areas of technology across all disciplines and common opportunities and challenges. So, yeah, save the date if you're interested. It'd be great to see you there. We're also launching a technical pathways lab, and this is about how we can reimagine really technical career pathways. Um, I mentioned just now that traditionally to advance your career, you had to become a manager. And now you can see that we've got this specialist pathway that's begun to emerge. What's really wonderful is that we've started to work with a number of organisations to try and reimagine how you get there. So Liverpool, for example, have just launched their research technical professional pathway, which actually offers a promotional route all the way up to boss or an equivalent as a technical specialist. And we've seen a number of our technician commitment signatories introduce that specialist pathway again up to proper or an equivalent. Indeed, um, Newcastle University have recently um, just appointed a new professor of practice who's a technical specialist in both cytometry. So it's our first technical specialist to be given that status, which is great. The Institute is going to be launching a new knowledge exchange scheme. And there's been quite a lot of excitement about this, actually. Um, so this is funding available for any technician at any UK research institute or university. They can apply to go on placement elsewhere in the UK and that might be to learn about a new piece of kit or to shadow someone or a new technique or so forth. Um, and then you can bring that back so to sign up, for example. Um, but we're also going to go global. So any technician can apply to go anywhere in the world through this fund to learn you know, where the best science is, for example, to bring that back to the UK. And as technicians, we've never really had this opportunity, this international you know, exchange opportunity. Um, so we're really, really excited to be offering that through the new institute. So do look out for that. Um, I know Sangha have been hugely supportive of the Herschel program. Um, this is something we launched a couple of years ago. The Herschel program is a program really to help develop women in either aspiring or current technical leadership positions. I led some research a few years ago, which found that we had a lack of women technical leaders and managers in higher education and research. Even in disciplines where women outnumbered men, women still weren't getting those management positions. And obviously that spoke very closely to me. Um, it's one thing to report this, but actually we need to intervene and try and do something. So Herschel was the idea we had to try and intervene. We went national with this programme straight away because of the extent of the issue. Um, and we thought we might get 40 women apply to be on Herschel in its first year. Um, in its first year, we took 180 women on the Herschel programme. We ran it again this year, a six month programme as well. We ran it again this year and 368 women completed it this year. It's been phenomenal, it's over 550 women have gone through this, which is brilliant. Um, and here's one of the pictures actually mm -hmm. from our very first um, very first celebration event last year. And it's been wonderful to see sign the colleagues on those courses. Um, I should say that Herschel has now moved to sit within the new institute and funding for that is secured for the next three years. So we've just opened applications for the next year's Herschel program um, on Monday, actually. So have a look if you've not already engaged with that. It's a really exciting new program. We've also launched a program in collaboration with the University of Nottingham's Business School. Uh, this is an executive program in strategic technical leadership. So the Talent Commission made a recommendation that organisations should have a strategic technical lead. Um, I guess in, in many ways that's my role at Nottingham, but it's quite, it's quite unique really to have someone who thinks about the strategic direction of the technical workforce of that organisation. I realised that there's nothing that helps you become one of these strategic technical leaders. There was no course I went on or anything, and actually that that could be tremendously helpful to learn about the landscape, all aspects of the system and so forth. 
Um, so we've developed in partnership, um, it's about a 12-week programme with a res residential at either end. Um, and what's been really great is that UKI have given us some funding to offer scholarships for the programme. So the first um, cohort of strategic technical leaders began just a few weeks ago, aged well due to finish in November. Um, this has been the most highly subscribed programme that the business school has run, actually, which is really exciting. And already we've had a lot of interest internationally. This is a deliberately small cohort. Um, we were originally going to take 15 colleagues, we upped it to 25, um, but we actually had over 60 applications. So it just shows that there is appetite for this sort of course. On, on the 31st of October, I don't know why we've picked Halloween actually, but it seems that we have. <laughs> we are launching some new technical leadership programs called the Vivian Thomas Technical Leadership Program. Um, there's going to be three types of leadership courses within the Vivian Thomas package. One is around collaborative leadership, one is around stepping into leadership, and the name of the third one escapes me right now, what's come on the spot, um, but you get the idea. These are leadership programmes for anyone at any level, um, from any background or discipline to attend to, and again, we've been really fortunate to receive some additional funding from UKRI to put these out nationally, so these are free for some colleagues to access and, and come on, so do look out for those when we launch them. Hopefully that's just given you some ideas of some of the areas of innovative practice. There'll be more, but it gives you a bit of a flavour to the practical things we're trying to do for the technical community through this institute. Integration is the fourth I, and really this is, you know, the ethos of the technician commitment. We bring technician commitment leads from all of our signatory and support organisations together twice a year. It's the most powerful network. You know, it's very much about, you know, being collaborative, sharing best practice, we absolutely encourage plagiarism completely. You know, this isn't about reinventing the wheel. This is about learning from what's already happening out there in the sector and bringing it back to your own organisation and helping and out that. Um, we're going to be continuing to build the technician commitment and um, technician commitment now sits within the Institute. So there's new signatory organisations coming on all the time. Um, we've gone international. So the University of Sydney are our first international signatory to the commitment. Um, it'd be very easy to go on a world tour, I think some of your colleagues this morning, but we're trying to go international in a very careful, structured way to ensure that we can really be supportive and, and, and you know, bring real support, progress and impact to those organisations, rather than me just jetting off to Hawaii <laughs> to give a talk or something. Um, we're trying to do it really, really carefully, um, and we'll be making an announcement about our second international signature soon, which does have the link to work, so look out for that. Um, I mentioned the other three eyes, so we are going to be improving, I guess, or trying to establish some links with private business, mentioned about how we're going to go international, and I've also talked about how our aim is to this institute to be sustainable, so the funder, everyone, all the partners see this as a permanent entity, we've just got to work out what the business model is going to be, you know, come August 2026, so that's my current aim. Um, it's really exciting for me because we've based the Institute at the University of Nottingham, so that's great. So not quite as many train trips for me, I guess. Uh, we haven't got the whole building. I realise that looks like quite, <laughs> quite grand, doesn't it? Um, but we're based in the area on, on, the, on the bottom left and all the branding's in the window now, actually, because this photo has been taken. Um, but that's where all the team are based. Um, so if you're ever in the area, do come and say hello. Um, this is the website for the Institute. Um, obviously, Funding only went live on the 1st of August, so it's still, you know, being developed in the background. The pages are going live week by week, so Herschel page is live now, for example, the Thomas page is live. Um, but you can also subscribe to a newsletter where it tells you about all the opportunities and developments that are going to be coming up the community in forthcoming weeks and months. Um, I just wanted to mention our technical council. Um, it was incredibly important to me that from a governance point of view, um, we had authenticity. Um, we've pulled together a technical council who are act as sort of a governance committee for the institute and are there to steer and guide the work of the institute to ensure that it is relevant and is what the technical community across the UK want. So we put a call out for members for this. Um, it's co-chaired by my colleagues Paul Gilbert and Andy Philby, so a technical manager and a technical specialist. Um, we have 15 technical colleagues from a range of different career stages, disciplines and backgrounds who are meeting together quarterly to advise us and steer us on what we're doing and actually also tell us if we're doing something wrong, because I think that's really, really important. Um, I'll close there. Hopefully I've given you a bit of a whistle stop tour of what's happened over the last six years and what's to come as well. Um, but really, really have to take any questions. I think you've got some time for that, haven't you, Rishi? But um, yeah, I'll close there. Thanks very much.